Early this year, I did a video based on a script that was titled 3060 Push to the Limits. And that script was written after seeing early info that stated the 3060 would actually be getting 12 gigabytes of VRAM. And it would be faster than the originally intended 6 gigabytes of bog standard 14 gigabit per second memory that both me and Gamers Nexus had been told by AIBs was the original plan. Now... It turns out the RAM speed was a bit wrong. It ended up being 15 gigabit per second, not 16, although that is faster than 14, of course. And in fact, it also turned out to not even be receiving the full GA106 die, being limited to 3,584 CUDA cores. But yeah, so I guess you would say the 3060 wasn't really pushed to the limits so much as adjusted slightly higher to be more competitive with what... Well, with what NVIDIA thought they would have to compete with after seeing the crazy competitive Navi 21 products, they thought AMD was going to release some sort of $400 to $429 12 gigabyte 6700 XT that would slot in just below the 3070 in performance. And then so logically, well, then there must be some $350 to $379 card, right, with 12 gigabytes that would likely blow the 3060 out of the water, especially if it was priced Pretty close to a 6 gigabyte card that was also weaker. People would laugh at getting that thing with half the VRAM capacity. And yeah, NVIDIA made a knee-jerk reaction. Doubling the VRAM capacity, as I've covered, instead of launching some weak 6 gigabyte card, they just put $30 more memory on it and priced it $30 higher than what they intended to price it. From NVIDIA's perspective, this was the lesser of two evils. You know, just passing along the GDR6 cost to give it 12 gigabytes in a typical decision. Usually they'd mark it up way more if they give you extra VRAM. This is a better decision in their opinion than trying to push their th round $300 6 gigabyte card to a 250 because AIB's told them even if the street price is higher than the MSRP, we're, we're just not going to profit below 300 You've got to figure out something else to do with GA106. And well, to be honest, I think NVIDIA made the wrong choice in thinking they should either give it a bunch of VRAM to compete with the 6700 non-XT or push the price down to where they're not really making a profit. There was a middle way they could have gone with that. In fact, I also don't even think is hindsight 2020. That should have been the logical conclusion. And it kind of gets us into a discussion on how Ampere segmentation is bizarre and nonsensical. Almost like NVIDIA was uh, was worried that RDNA 2 would be a huge threat, but wasn't willing to do what was necessary to make their lineup as competitive as possible. They did little tweaks here and there, and it really wasn't enough to at least on paper compete. Although, again, everything's selling like crazy right now, so this is somewhat of an academic discussion. But one that I think is an interesting one to have. And before we go deeper into what I think the RTX 3060 should have been, well, this is also my review video of an RTX 3060 that I've had weeks to play with and use next to my 3070 to come to an opinion about really where this should be priced next to other cards in the market. You know, forget MSRP, should the 3070 cost 50% more money is an easy question to ask here that can be answered. So let's go into some of the benchmarks. So first, I actually want to start with my results from Deep Rock Galactic, which I was typically playing in around 4K at around a locked 120 hertz with the 3070, but it would sometimes drop to 100 hertz at 75% resolution scale. And I'm fine doing that in this game because with TAA and how resolution scale works in this game, Deep Rock Galactic, it looks fine. I think 75 resolution scale looks barely worse than full 4K. And I found that the 3070 was basically the same experience as gaming on a 6800 XT or 3080 Ti. And I found the 3060 to be pretty close. It went down to 60% resolution scale. It definitely dropped below 100 far more often, but it was still a fun game. The experience was still roughly the same. And yeah, we had a card that was probably about 30% weaker, but gave you more VRAM for the games that need it and cost less than a 3070 most of the time. I was hoping that's what my review of the 3060 would be, that if a 3070 costs 50% more, and you're a mid-range gamer, especially in 1440p, eh, just get the 3060, you get more VRAM, it costs less, and most of the time it's the same experience, which is a type of product that I think is worth 
like championing. Like when I had a Radeon 7 in my 3070 review, there were some games like Resident Evil 2 where I could get roughly equivalent image quality, roughly equivalent frame rates, and then I could game in 4K, whereas I couldn't on my 3070 in all areas of the game. You know, it didn't need the extra grunt. It just needed more VRAM. That's what I was hoping the 3060 would be overall. But that's not what I found. Games like Deep Rock Galactic, unfortunately, were the outlier. In early benchmarking, I found the 3060 was quite a bit weaker than the 3070, overclock to overclock. So that's my apples to apples comparison. Yeah, the, the 3070 was actually often more than 40% stronger, not like the 30% I saw in some of the other games in my early testing. And then games like Mountain Blade 2 really disappointed me because, well, I was lukewarm on the use of DLSS and Mountain Blade during my A6000 review, but that's because back then it was buggy and ultimately didn't deliver, I felt, a better experience than a 3080 Ti or the 6800 XT overclock gave me at native 4K. However, I did say that with DLSS quality, if it became stable, the 3070 would perform fine without needing a more expensive card. And it does by now, by the way. So I was hoping a 3060 with DLSS would run at a respectable performance level for the price. And that's just not what I found. And I didn't go into this expecting too much. I didn't even try native 4K right away. I immediately went in with 4K with DLSS and it was usually below 50 frames per second, far weaker than like the 90 frames per second I was getting with my 3070. And I tried even the horrible ultra performance mode that does not look good in my opinion. And it, it wasn't enough. Eventually I had to try 1440p with DLSS to get some level of frame rate close to what I got with the 3070 and 4K native. The 3070 felt at least 50% better than the 3060. And so I guess, yeah, Mountain Blade 2 is one of those games where the 64% more CUDA cores are really being used by the game. Honestly, with the 3060, I would have probably... If this was my card, just been gaming in 1080p like I was years ago with a Vega 64, which, yeah, on average, in my quantitative benchmarking, this thing isn't any better than a Vega graphics card. I'm sure it would trade blows with a 5700 if I had one on hand still, but I think a 5700 XT would crush this, and I have no doubt the 6600 XT is going to crush the 3060 as well. And it's funny that I bring up the Vega card that this can't even beat because, well, oftentimes I recommended Vega 56 or Vega 64s that were selling on eBay for, if you can believe it, over a year ago below $200 as an excellent option for budget 4K gaming. You know, 4K gaming where you turn down half the settings and you're okay with FreeSync helping you, but if you have a 4K60 monitor, it's you know, mostly good enough considering you're paying $200 or less. But that was over a year ago, and the 3060 isn't even at that old performance level. This just isn't even remotely a 4K gaming budget card, or in my opinion, even really a good 1440p card. The 12 gigabytes is useless on this thing. Especially in Metro Exodus, I had to just keep dropping resolution settings and DLSS levels until I got to a point where finally it was running above 60 frames per second, and it just looked so much worse than the 3070. This was another game where that massive CUDA core boost from the 3060 to the 3070 was definitely resulting in an over 50% performance boost. And so, yeah, I, I, are you seeing my point after this testing? This configuration with 12 gigabytes of VRAM doesn't make any sense. This card just isn't capable of 4K like even my old Radeon 7 was with a few settings turned down. Or even really, in my experience, at decent 1440p. NVIDIA wanted either a $340 12 gigabyte card like this or a $280 weaker 6 gigabyte card. And... Well, let's get into it then, huh? I think the right choice 
for NVIDIA would have been to give it six gigabytes of VRAM and just push the thing to the limits. Give it the full 3,840 CUDA cores. Push the clocks 5% higher, which was a breeze to overclock to at this card, by the way. And let it use 200 watts or even 220 watts. Who cares? And then if GA106 can accept it, I don't think people should doubt it can, accept GDR6X, Give the top model GDR6X from discussions with my sources. GDR6X is like, well, it was an extra dollar per gigabyte compared to GDR6. And this part's hindsight 2020, but because only NVIDIA is using GDR6X, it's actually cheaper per gigabyte right now than standard GDR6. And even if this couldn't have handled GDR6X, I think it would have been better to just go with 16 gigabit per second GDR6 and price it at like $320. And if NVIDIA would have given this the full die with just six gigabytes of RAM, but six gigabytes of RAM with at least 16 gigabit per second, or maybe 19 gigabit per second GDR6X, I believe this would have been a pretty decent card, especially given current market conditions. I mean, it would have been 10 to 15% stronger and cost less than what this MSRP was, at least at launch, of course. And after the current shortages, it would have been easier to keep it below $400. In fact, I actually want to show my estimated performance level in the division too. If I just, you know, go with increased teraflops, average with increased bandwidth, and maybe it'd be a little less than this, but it's just to illustrate a point. I believe a GDR6X model pushed a little further with the full die could have performed here, you know, and I believe even with GDR6X, if it was just six gigabytes, they would have probably been able to price this closer to 329. So think of that, 329 dollars for something that's basically an almost 2080 or if it used standard gdr6 i bet they could have gotten away with you know 320 dollars for a six gigabyte model with the full die pushed harder and that would have been around a 2070 super yes with just six gigabytes but far cheaper than what the 2070 super was at and Again, it just needs to be mentioned. This just is not capable of 4K, and it's barely capable of 1440p in my experience. It's not even a 5700 XT, and I suspect in my games it would have probably lost to a 5700 overclock to overclock. This really, really should have just been a really pushed 1080p gaming card or 1440p gaming card for people willing to turn down textures, and it would have had a more competitive price. I mean, guys, I'm not kidding. It probably costs more to produce this graphics card than it does a 3060 Ti. It's completely borked. And NVIDIA should have and really did see shortages coming. So I don't know what they were thinking. In fact, I don't really know what they were thinking with the segmentation of their Ampere lineup. I've had this script lying around that was basically looking at how the Ampere lineup could have been more perfectly segmented for a while. And I thought a few months ago it would have only made sense to go in two directions. The first option to make a better segmented lineup I just called the enthusiast leadership option where Nvidia actually launches their lineup at $100 to $200 higher MSRPs than what they did but gives you the full amount of VRAM for each SKU. You know, think not a 30 90 with 24 gigabytes, call it the 3080 Ti. Not a 3080 with 10 gigabytes, give it the full bus and normal GDR6, 24 gigabytes. They could have sold that for $900. And if they launched a 24 gigabyte card for $900, which actually at the launch of Ampere would have been a higher profit margin than the $700 version with just 10 gigabytes because GDR6 hadn't exploded in pricing yet, no one would have complained. No one would have complained that the 80 is now 900, which now Nvidia can just say that's what they're going to charge for 80s moving forward. Forward if it had that much RAM and no one would have complained about a $600 3070 if it had 16 gigabytes or a $500 3060 Ti if that had 16. But at this point, it's not worth talking about the high VRAM option when GDR6 prices have exploded. It's a bit of hindsight 2020 saying that wasn't a good option, but I think it would look silly to spend any time in this video talking about that one. So if we go with the aggressive option, which is actually the option I liked more anyways, yeah, I think that this here 
should not have been how they segmented it at all. I think what they should have done is used full GA106 pushed harder with GDR6X for around 330 or 350 and called that the 3060 Ti. And then above that, I think they should have had a $450 3070 that was more cut down, but had normal 8 gigabytes of GDR6. And then the 3070 Ti should just be what it is now, but 550 and been there at all the Ampere launch, not released later, basically, to use up more GDR6 after they found out it costs less to use than uh, to use GDR6X than GDR6. And then above that, I think they should have just had a $700 or $750 3080 12 gigabyte with normal GDR6, and then just a 1,030 Ti 12 gigabyte GDR6X. I don't even know if I would have bothered with the 3090. It's kind of pointless. They should have just accepted it. Lower the price a little bit, give it 12 gigabytes of the fastest GDR6X you can, and push the performance to the limits, because... AMD just wins this round with GDR6 capacity. If NVIDIA wanted to be competitive, they just should have focused purely on price and performance level and kept the GDR6 lower so they could have kept those prices more competitive. And again, I do not believe this is hindsight is 2020. NVIDIA knew that costs could go up and they bought massive amounts of GDR6 to control those prices early on in the Ampere launch, as I have covered in numerous videos and articles. You know, NVIDIA could have seen this coming and at the end of the day, doesn't really matter if they saw the shortages coming. This thing, just giving it 12 gigabytes of VRAM is really a weird knee-jerk reaction to the worry of a 12 gigabyte 6700 launching for 350. This thing is just way too weak to compete with it anyways. They should have just pushed it as hard as possible and tried to keep the price down. But they didn't. And I'm sure there are already people spamming the comments before finishing the video saying, it doesn't matter, Ampere's outselling AMD. It, it doesn't matter. Everything shipped by both AMD and NVIDIA is selling immediately, and NVIDIA is shipping more products than AMD. So this is, like I said early on, mostly an academic discussion, but one that I'm sure NVIDIA is having internally when they prepare Lovelace. I'm guessing they'll make a lot less mistakes with Lovelace, or at least they won't make the same mistakes. It's hard to call them big mistakes when they're making so much money. Yeah, I think that what they're going to do is more evenly segment Lovelace and make sure to launch it with jacked up prices when they end of life Ampere around mid next year. And of all of those lessons as well, the biggest one I'm sure they have learned is that if you ship more products, people will just buy it. And like I've covered, <laughs> that's what NVIDIA plans to do. But all of that is for another video. I just wanted to talk about all the schizophrenic segmentation of Ampere for a bit because I do think it's interesting. When it comes to an actual RTX 3060 review, the last thing I really have to say, though, is that, look, it's hard to say what this card is worth when you can't get a hold of anything right now. But if you could eventually, let's say, find used 5700 XTs for below 350, that's certainly better than getting this for 400. And um, if you were comparing this to other cards, if this is selling, let's say, for over 400, which it probably will be, next to some around the same price 6600 XTs, I'd actually probably pick the 6600 XT when that launches soon. And if you're looking at this or a 3060 Ti for like 10% more, get the 3060 Ti. If the 3070 is 40% more, it's actually worth it despite having less VRAM because there are some games where it's over 50% stronger. And this card... I'm sorry, unless you're doing professional work that requires the VRAM, this performance level is just not worth being remotely priced next to the 6700 XT or anything above it. This thing really should be a sub $400 card. I would not bother paying anywhere close to the same amount for this as pretty much any other card on the market that is Ampere or RDNA 2 right now. And that's going to just about do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed the kind of combination observations and perspectives with a 3060 review combo put together. It's I did that because I didn't think there'd be enough to say really about a whole 3060 video. I thought talking about the Ampere segmentation had to be part of the discussion in any 3060 review as this card is just so wonkily configured. 
If you did enjoy it, please like it and share. That helps the channel a ton. You know, subscribe to Moore's Law is Dead, ring the bell button. And if you have any extra money, consider supporting us on Patreon. That helps support me and the other people on the Moore's Law is Dead team. And we really do need your support. You get early ad free access to podcasts, exclusive podcasts, ask me and guest questions for Broken Silicon, and access to the Discord where there's a whole community waiting to talk to you about this video. And then, of course, as always, thank you for watching.